Pinhorn Dar Akriata. Good afternoon and welcome to Public Health Network Career's webinar series. My name is Christian Heathcote Elliott and I'm a Principal Public Health Practitioner in the wider determinants of health unit Public Health Wales. I'm really pleased that you've joined us today to find out more about community resilience in Wales, more than ever with the cost of living crisis, climate change emergency and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, our individuals, communities and society's abilities to adapt to stress and adverse circumstances have become increasingly important to protecting our health and well-being. I'm therefore really delighted to welcome our speakers, Nick Selwyn, Fred Weston and Catherine Cribb, who will be discussing local authority support to communities during and post-pandemic, and Charlotte Gray and Lucy Lutier Homolova, who will be presenting findings from a study exploring community-led action during the pandemic in Wales. And the speakers will introduce themselves and the organisations um, they work for as they uh, present. Before handing you over to our speakers, a few um, housekeeping rules. So after the presentations, there will be a chance for you to ask questions. If you could use the question and answer chat box on the right hand side in the top of the screen to put in your questions. And we welcome correspondence both in English and Welsh. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Public Health Network Cymru's website after the session. And throughout the webinar, if you do experience any technical difficulties, then please let us know through the question answer box and the team can contact you directly. Unfortunately, um, I won't be able to stay through the whole of the webinar today, um, but my colleague Katrin Evans from the network team will be facilitating the question and answer session. So I really hope you today enjoy today's webinar and I'll now hand over to our speakers. Diakana. Thank you, Christian. Uh, this is Nick Selwyn from All in Wales. I've got the first slot. I'm just going to share screen. If someone could tell me that they can see the slides that I've put up before I launch into it and discover they're not appearing. Have they turned up? Yes, they're up. That's great, thank you. So as Christian said, um, the onus is on us to introduce ourselves. So my name is Nick Sell and I work for All in Wales and um, I have responsibility for delivering a programme of national reviews that the Auditor General takes annually, looking at how local government provides services. And the focus of our work is very much around the use of resources, but also the delivery of statutory responsibilities and finding new ways of working. Just to, to set the scene for the work we've undertaken, um, and really the starting point for why we've been looking at community resilience and self-reliance, uh, is really the context in which local authorities find themselves these days. Um, I think we acknowledge in the report that we published last week, which this is drawn from, that at present local authorities are really facing a daunting challenge um, and quite an uncertain future in terms of their finances. We're well aware of the austerity challenges that have been in place for the last decade or so, and, and the predicted budget problems that most public services will face going forward. Uh, and this really sets the context of the type of services that people are now providing. And in recent years, there's been a significant reduction in the type of activity that local authorities are undertaking. Some services have been protected more than others, but in many core areas, the type of services that people receive on the ground have changed radically in ways that really don't allow them to benefit from the services that they used to have. Coupled with this reduction, there's also been a significant growth in demand. I'll just use one statistic post-pandemic, since the pandemic, we've seen homelessness grow by around 27% in Wales, and the numbers in temporary accommodation by 273%. And you can look at these patterns of growth and demand on services across many areas. So we know that authorities are really challenged to find ways of helping people who are in quite acute, difficult problems. Um, as well as the growth in demand, there's been an increase in the type of work and the responsibilities authorities have. The Senate have passed several pieces of legislation that place new duties on councils and new expectations to deliver services in quite transformational and different ways. Um, we just have one going through now around building safety, which is going to be quite challenging for local authorities to take on. Uh, Christian mentioned the difficulties around the post-pandemic recovery and the cost of living crisis, and, and really we're talking about Wales as a country with entrenched poverty. So when you think of this context, it's unsurprising that many authorities in Wales are looking at opportunities to find ways of doing things differently that really encourage people to almost become self-reliant and less dependent on the state. That's the context for our work. In terms of the starting points, in our report, we've tried to focus on really understanding what does 
community resilience and self-reliance look like? Ultimately, it's, a, it's really about doing less as an authority directly and shifting um, more towards influencing and enabling others to do more for people and more for themselves. But this is not an easy thing to achieve. There are some significant barriers in place. From our review and work with councils, what we found was that defining the problem very clearly is quite difficult. People can often articulate what it isn't, but defining what it is is almost intangible in many cases. It's not helped by some of the legislation that underpins the work of local government. So the Civil Contingency Act, which is really paramount about how you deal with emergencies, floods, fires, natural disasters, that sort of thing, is often used to determine how resilient the community is. But when you're talking about creating conditions that allow people to do more for themselves and be less reliant on the state, then you're looking for softer ways of influencing behaviour. And that's not really covered by the legislation. Saying that, we found through our review that roughly 19 of the 22 authorities in Wales have all prioritised activity in this area and are really trying to focus on creating the conditions to enable people to do more for themselves and be less, less reliant on services. I guess our overwhelming view is that whilst that's a real positive direction to travel, a lot of the work is quite poorly defined and the actions that sit below it don't really get into the depth um, and areas that you would expect to see being promoted. And then finally, there is a real challenge for councils to really change how they operate. They've often been providing a safety net to communities to help people who are struggling. I think this change is now requiring to do things quite differently, and that's not easy. But the one light that we can draw on is the pandemic to ensure that communities can do more and are able to do more. In terms of where authorities currently are pitching their work in, in helping to build stronger, more resilient communities and empower people, we broadly report on four areas where we've seen some really good practice taking place across Wales. And I know that um, fellow speakers in this event will be touching on these, so I won't run into these in huge amounts of depth. The first one, and unsurprising really, is, is the real growth in volunteering and where people are stepping up and coming forward to help public services and voluntary bodies to run many services across Wales which people use. Um, I guess there are some risks around this. You are placing a great onus on local communities to be able to respond. Not every community has the demographic of the type of person or the type of people that would be able to take on this role in many areas. There's also a risk of competition between different organisations and doing that with ever more work being pushed in this direction. But we did see some really positive practice in volunteering. And I think as an area, that's something that we could see becoming more central to how authorities are trying to strengthen community resilience. Second area then is really about empowering communities, putting in place the structures and funding to enable communities to do a lot more for themselves. And there's some really good practice developing in Wales. Um, we were taken by, really taken by the working particularly with their community empowerment grant, where members are funded local um, voluntary bodies and local um, community groups to undertake work which traditionally would have formed the authority. Uh, the fourth area we touched on in our report is around community asset transfers. There's a long history of authorities working to divest themselves of assets that could be used for community benefit. Um, I guess that the outcome of this is fairly mixed. There's been some really good positive practice in some areas, less so in others. But as an option, it does enable communities to become more involved in delivering services on the ground. And then the final area, one which is probably the more recent sort of development, is how councils are now promoting more access to community-based services through things like hubs and the work of community connectors. And our report touches on some really good positive practice from Pembrokeshire, Bridgend and, and Gwynedd. But I do know that Fred and colleagues will be touching on that one a bit later. Those are the current approaches, but equally in our work, we did draw through some of the barriers that we are seeing at present in terms of the difficulties that organisations are finding in delivering the, the, the sort of shift towards people taking on more responsibility for sorting out their own problems. Um, the big one, and unsurprising, is really resources. Councils don't have a huge amount of resource that they can push towards this area of activity. They've often seen an erosion in capacity and skills. And it's an area which has really suffered through austerity. So it's unsurprising that having the ability to, to prioritise this work for the many other things they have to do is quite challenging. Um, and that's really been drawn out by their inability to also redirect resources from core statutory activity into what is often seen as, as an add-on to the, to the work they have to deliver. There's some issues of concern, certainly raised by the Office of Reinterviews in local government around the trust within communities for authorities to push work down towards them, but also an appetite to take on more themselves. And I mentioned that this real difficult culture and trying to break the pattern of how councils have traditionally worked and almost taken on a new way of working and delivering services. And to do that, you really need to be joined up and working with the key leaders within your local communities 
to really understand how things work on the ground. And I don't think authorities are necessarily in the place to, to benefit from that because of the issues I've raised already. Um, I've touched on, on the lack of strategic vision and how that can hamper planning and understanding. Um, but really the big challenge, I guess, within Wales at this time is some real fundamental prevailing challenges around poverty, rurality and exclusion. So there are significant barriers to overcome and we recognise that in our work. What we have tried to do, however, is draw through what we feel are some of the key principles that councils and others should think about in taking forward the work. So firstly, the six things that we draw on as, as the opportunities and the things to think about how you can shape this area of activity. The first one is really having a clear vision, setting out what you really are trying to achieve through your work on developing communities to be more resilient and creating people who are more self-reliant and less um, creating less demand on council services. And that really is about pitching very clearly what this actually means in practice. But once you've done that, it's important to have that two-way dialogue with communities and people who use your services, really setting out what they can expect from you going forward, um, but also what they can't expect from you going forward and how they will have to do things differently. We see that, that members have a fundamental role in helping to support this shift. They are the representatives of their local communities and traditionally have been almost the voice and ears of, of those communities within the authority being able to direct people to services and ensure services are provided. Going forward, they're going to have a very different role. They're going to have to find ways of equipping their local community to do things differently and do things for themselves and almost encourage them not to be dependent on, on the authority. And that's a big change in, and a big ask for members to shift that role. And that's partly reflected in our fourth point, which is very much around how you need to refocus the work of local authority officers. They're going to have to do things quite differently in the future if they are to create um, communities which are less reliant on their services. And this is where we have some real challenges, I guess, in terms of how this picture runs across Wales. Not all areas are starting from the same place and not all areas will have the benefits of their demography, geography, their local communities. Um, so you need to find solutions that are best suited to your local circumstances. And then the final one, and the one that probably has the, the, the biggest potential impact is ensuring that you can um, use your resources and your assets to keep wealth local. And in our report, we draw some good practice examples that we've identified through the review. And I'll just touch on some of these um, just to give you a flavour of the sort of things that, that is happening elsewhere within Great Britain. So firstly, in terms of getting that strategic direction set out and having a very clear vision of what you want to achieve, we felt the approach that Bristol has adopted with its community resilience strategy, adopted seven years ago now, that really sort of identifies how they foresee the future, I guess, within that particular area. Um, how they really want to develop communities and work in partnership with local areas. But it makes very clear that the authority is going to be withdrawn from certain areas of operation and pushing activity downwards and outwards. There's some really good positive practice in Scotland in particular about the sort of community led approach to involvement. Uh, and we commend the sort of work of the community charrettes model. Um, I'm not sure how familiar people are with charrettes. It's a, an intensive involvement activity which brings together people from a local community with experts in a given topic that is of interest to that community or the problem that's at hand and public sector representatives. And they go through an intensive period of negotiation, discussion, action planning, usually over a weekend or two days, um, and then come up with an action plan setting out the priorities for action in that area and how they will focus um, their resources to help develop and respond to the problems. Over time, it results in where it's successful, the community taking more ownership and basically running and managing situations for themselves. And there's some really good examples in Scotland of how this model's been used, particularly in the regeneration field in places like Creeth, Glen Ross and Campbelltown in our Highlands East. One of the authorities in England we felt that um, was really good at building this community resilience narrative is Oldham. And the area that they've really focused a lot of efforts on is equipping members to take on a new and different role they've developed a leadership program for their councillors to really focus on equipping them with the skills needed to work with communities, be the representative and champion of those communities, but also to direct them away from the council to finding their own solutions. And we think that's got a lot of um, opportunity to be sort of copied and, and used in Wales as a principle. Scotland has some really good approaches to community empowerment. They developed a piece of legislation in 2015, which introduces some big, big differences to approaches in Wales. Communities now have the right to be to be consulted and to participate in key decisions on local assets and decisions around local services. 
um, communities can actually acquire land and vacant buildings if they can demonstrate the benefit to the community. So this, this coherence at a national level in Scotland is helping communities take on more of a direct role in finding their own solutions to the problems they face. And then the final one, and probably the one that's probably had the most um, conversation across Great Britain, is the work within Preston City Council, which is often sort of called the Preston Model, and how they've approached the use of anchor institutions to use local buy-in power to benefit local areas. Um, just touch on anchor institutions. It, it's a generic phrase, but basically it's using the big local organisations within an area to work with the public sector to find solutions to local problems and drawing on their skills, knowledge, clout, financial abilities to, to really benefit the local area. And in Preston, the council's put in place what, what they call the Preston model, a series of actions to really work with local anchor institutions, but also to use their buying power in a very different way. So the sort of things that Preston are doing are promoting uh, the use of a, a mutual bank they developed with Liverpool City Council and the Wirral, where they put their money aside and they're using that to fund local SMEs, social enterprises and community interest groups and cooperatives to take on and develop new ways of working. They're also influencing supply chain and providers to the authority to start using local organisations. So in essence, all the funding the authority has available is being invested in opportunities to keep that wealth within Preston so you get more return for your investment. That's a, a very quick run through our key findings. In terms of work itself, um, our report was published last week and it's one of three reports that we've um, produced looking at the impact of poverty. The first one was very much a baseline just summarising the current challenges facing um, local authorities in the wider public sector in Wales. And then we focused on two pieces of work looking at opportunities to do things differently to help people who are struggling with the cost of living crisis, but also um, tackle some of the entrenched issues around poverty. One on social enterprises in December and this one on strengthening community resilience. Our work will be presented to the Public Accounts uh, Committee and that's taking place tomorrow. So members on the Senate Committee will have the opportunity to determine whether they wish to do any follow-up work. And in terms of our findings, we've made two recommendations uh, and provided what we call a self-evaluation tool that would be provided to authorities to enable them to determine how they currently compare with some of the, the practice that we've identified across Great Britain, um, which we've been turning into an action plan to take forward work on community resilience. In terms of contacts, um, my colleague was due to be here today, but unfortunately couldn't make it up to Eros Lake. And uh, I'm Nick Selwyn, so that's our email address is if anyone wants to contact us after the event. I've also put in the links um, our website, but also directly to our reports. So I'll stop sharing there. And I'll hand over to the next speaker, which I believe is Charlotte and Lucia. Super, thank you. Um, so uh, just to introduce ourselves, um, and then Lucia is going to be sharing the slides. So if you can put them up, Lucia, that'd be great. Uh, but my name is Charlotte Gray and I work very closely with Lucia Homolova. We both work within the Research and Evaluation Division um, at Public Health Wales, and we've been there for a number of years. And the piece of work that we are going to be presenting today, it was a 12 month research project that we undertook in 2021 during the pandemic. And it was funded by the Health Foundation under their COVID-19 research programme. So this piece of work was undertaken in partnership with the University of Bristol and the Wales Council for Voluntary Action. And we had a really broad steering group with a number of representatives from across Wales, including Welsh Government. And the aim of the study overall was to understand the role of community led action during the pandemic. And specifically, we explored the factors that enabled community-led action, the role that community-led action had in addressing the underlying determinants of inequalities of health in communities. And as Nick mentioned in the previous talk, it's that in, uh, inequity between communities and what, what, what's happening there. And understanding how community-led action might be sustained and integrated post-pandemic into existing health, third sector and social support systems. And through the presentation, we're going to present our findings twofold. And one is an overview of the conditions that enabled this community led action in response to the pandemic. And then we bring together our findings into a framework for enabling and sustaining this volunteering and community led action in future pandemics. If you can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So I mentioned the word community led action and, and as part of being researchers, as part of our report, we have to define things and we wanted to look beyond just traditional volunteers, but um, looking at a range of unpaid and freely chosen volunteering activities undertaken by informal volunteers. So this might be individuals supporting a neighbour. It could be individuals that are becoming part of a lo hyper local community group during the pandemic and also more formalised volunteers who might be, for example, working through a regional or national organisation. Or in fact, what we did find, and Lucia will talk about a little bit later, that a lot of people undertook community-led action as a real mixture of both the formal and informal. So we know, um, for, we've seen everywhere, there's multiple reports on it, that during the pandemic, community-led action, it sprang up all over the place, um, really organically, in response to both the health consequences, but also the social consequences of the virus and all of the um, restrictions that were put upon us, such as lockdowns uh, during the pandemic, as well as it was in a response to emergent needs from the population. So things that we really hadn't predicted previously. Citizens were motivated and engaged in a collective response to need in their communities or a perceived need in their communities and a desire to really wanting to support those they perceived as the most vulnerable. So those perhaps that were, were within their home and needed support because in fact they, they had they were in in a lockdown. They were in an individual lockdown at the time. Couldn't get hold of of various medicines. Couldn't access things that they normally would have done. Community led action played a really vital role in helping those affected, as well as supporting official agencies, and became a really integral, informal part of a wider formal response to the pandemic. And we found that communities themselves are really knowledgeable about their own needs and how to meet them and have established connections and trust already. And there's real potential for longer term involvement in volunteering, drawing on community assets and resources, anchor institutions, social connections, local knowledge. If you can move to the next slide, please. So just briefly to touch on the methodology for this piece of work, we adopted a mixed methods approach and it included a survey of volunteers across Wales. We wanted to explore the wider context of community participation in voluntary activities and those factors contributing to it. So we had an online survey and for digital exclusion reasons, it was also on request in telephone and paper form. This was hosted by a market research company that we commissioned to undertake this piece of work and was open between May and July 2021. And we targeted it towards formal and informal volunteers across Wales. And we recruited it, spent a lot of time doing a lot of desk work to recruit people. And it was through a really uh, multifaceted snowballing approach. So getting hold of organisations, both larger and smaller ones, and trying to really reach as many people involved in, in, in community led action during the pandemic as we possibly could. And we achieved over 2000 eligible responses from across Wales. And we collected data on things like um, the individual socioeconomic details, their level of engagement and activities at different stages in the pandemic and prior, um, data on their sort of level of personal resilience, their health and wealth being status, their sort of intention to continue volunteering post pandemic and the various barriers and enablers that they faced trying to, to support their communities. And in addition, we undertook some qualitative semi-structured interviews, 51 in total, and this was to understand the experiences of stakeholders across the system. And the aim was to capture perspectives of those who volunteered in different ways on the ground, those who received the support from those who volunteers, so the recipients of support, as well as those who coordinated the support, so more at that system level. And we focused this down on two communities in South Wales. Uh, we wanted to get quite a spread of interviews um, so we couldn't do it all over Wales. We focused it on two different communities. Uh, they happened to be in South Wales and we chose them to have a similar population size to reflect an urban and rural environment. Um, and also both of them having a high need for support. Uh, one of them was a really traditional um, area of, of, of high deprivation and the other had pockets of hidden deprivation. So they faced really different challenges during the pandemic and they were actively identified and chosen using our steering group. 
which had representation from different groups, as I mentioned earlier, including the WCVA, the County Voluntary Councils and the Wales Local Government Association, as well as involvement from our PPIE members. I'm going to pass over to Lucia now for the next bit. Thank you, Shanti. And I will touch briefly on some of our key findings from the um, survey as well as the qualitative interviews. So when we look at the results from the survey, we actually found that compared to before the pandemic, um, there were some notable changes in who was taking part in voluntary activities and um, so the, the demographic profile of the volunteers as well as um, changes in what activities they were involved in, the level of frequency um, and for how long. Um, and actually in that profile, um, there were clearly kind of three distinct groups um, appearing. Um, one of them was uh, what we termed the emerging or new volunteers who were individuals who were largely actually a working age population um, and they were new to volunteering so that they were volunteering for the first time in their life uh, specifically during the pandemic um, and they had a preference for much more um, unstructured and informal voluntary activities so more activities involved in their community or kind of neighbourhood street level activities. Then we had volunteers who um, already existed uh, prior to the pandemic, but actually uh, this was a large proportion um, of our survey respondents who during the pandemic picked up lots of new additional activities um, and um, what that resulted in is they were expanding their reach um, across the different mix settings. And as you can see on this really sorry tiny diagram, a uh, sunky diagram that um, on the left hand side is the kind of level of type of activities before the pandemic and on the right hand side is during the pandemic as you can see there's been a lot of movement and a lot of uh, fluidity during that time and the third uh, group of the type of volunteers were those who were uh, volunteering previously but however during the pandemic had to step back because uh, during the shielding requirements or uh, you know became one of those groups who were clinically vulnerable which actually had quite a knock-on impact on services delivery so this has kind of resulted in some sort of shifts that instead of traditionally, you know, um, if you look at National Survey for Wales, I think 2019-20 data, um, the, the age group for the volunteer profile was between 65 and 74 years old, I think. Um, whereas during the pandemic, we started seeing a much more younger population and uh, particularly working age population coming forward as well. And, and given these changes in the behaviours and the uh, activities involved on the ground through the qualitative insights, we also look at the what were the common factors that were actually contributing to um, you know these individual participation, but also um, enabling these community that this community action to um, uh, to take place. Um, so that's we consider this from the individual level factors community level factors but also in terms of the unique context that the pandemic presented um so as charlotte mentioned we had that uniqueness of the context of that having that national call for action the permission to act as well as um there's that sense of heightened urgency and the scale of the global emergency alongside uh you know the disruption to service provision whether that was third sectors public sector statutory provision um voluntary sector um and then you have these little community groups on the site picking up and really trying to set up a response in and uh, responding to the local needs that were emerging and you know especially at the beginning uh, there was that concept that they were filling in a gap while services are trying to restructure their provision um, and combine that with the impacts of the virus and you know health and social consequences as well as the socioeconomic impacts we've had changes on the individual levels in terms of you know for example shifting to home working you know um, changes in financial provisions such as the furlough scheme reductions in um, income potential redundancies as well as uh, shift to part-time working and suddenly you have a cohort of people who are um, spending a lot more time you know in combination with things like uh, travel restrictions and uh, lockdown measures and say to have to stay local you suddenly have a cohort of people who are spending a lot more time in their communities and you know with the opportunities to connect locally and um, offer their transferable skills and resources as well on that community level 
we've noticed actually that that you know there wasn't a one size fit all approach. There was quite a, a degree, the degree of response and coordination of that support varied depending on uh, the area, depending on the community, you know, the profile of the population that lived there, um, as well as um, depending on the resources that they as 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 a community had access to and we actually found that you know plays in that sense was really important factors in determining how um, this happened and when we look at the um, differences between the community groups um, and you know just to illustrate we've seen responses on on a number of levels you could have a hyper level on hyper level response on street level you know neighborhood level area local coordination and local area response team, you know, reach, um, on top of the regional and the national. And um, so actually the community groups that were uh, much more rapid in their activities were those who already had very strong social networks. Um, as Nick also touched on, uh, perhaps they have a very um, active and co-organization by that. I mean, an organization that's well embedded and rooted in the community. Um, it could be, you know, in small village, it could be a village hall. It could be, uh, you know, as um, Nick mentioned, a kind of large organization structure. But what they've offered was a foundation and infrastructure that was already there that the community could draw upon um, and really uh, set up and coordinate a response as well as the volunteer recruitment and then scale it up. Um, so in that response, really, there was um, the the place based support and the value of the strong local connections really came forward. The other element that really um, was appearing quite strong is that um, kind of catalyst for change was the emergence of the uh, visibly strong partnership working so partnership and cross sectoral working across public sector organization and the community groups on the ground um which created a often uh, an integrated response and you know each contributing with their own expertise um we also look at um in, in the findings to try and identify what were the conditions that enabled um, these communities to thrive and uh, you know were supporting of that environment. Um, so from the data there was three kind of um, key conditions that emerged. Uh, one of them is really having the, a good understanding of the local community assets um, and, uh, and that kind of place factors I've mentioned um, earlier. Um, and you know, highlighted was that that value of local delivery, driving a local social network connection informed by local knowledge and local people, um, but also ability of that community to leverage uh, those resources. And I'm talking, you know, social capital or human capital in the sense of the resources and the skills of the individual members as well. Um, as the ability of the, the you know wider community assets um, and that you really saw the difference in uh, kind of the speed of setup and the ability and capacity to coordinate um, the response. The other element um, as I mentioned was the integration of community action into wider system uh, for example the um, local um, authorities that have locality response team uh, or community hubs and um, alongside this they continued mapping the community support provision in their area so they could understand you know if there's a request for a particular area they know which groups operate on that in that area and they could uh, reach out to a particular group to ask for support and this was very effective cross-sectoral working and um, actually empowered and enabled local action and as a result what we've seen was expansion in the capacity and the reach of support as well as um, you know community groups on one hand were much more agile and they were able to respond to emerging needs much quicker than um, statutory organizations for example um, and this community partnership model also uh, resulted in kind of sense of strength and strength and community cohesion, as well as um, kind of sense of uh, community belonging. Um, and if we consider this uh, from the perspective of maybe um, driving health equity, then if we think about the kind of whole system approach to creating empowered and connected communities, is about having also that um, underlying pol policy coherence um, and, and that supports the environment that can nurture and enable uh, social participations and a sense of empowerment. Um, and one of the you know a strong element of these community groups that came forward was that they had a strong sense of uh, autonomy and ownership. And so it's about finding way to to work in partnership and provide support, but also um, not formalizing the informal too much. And lastly, um, Drawing on those findings from the uh, qualitative insights as well as survey, um, 
we try to answer the question of, you know, um, how do we sustain these um, activities going forward? How do we sustain the momentum uh, when and don't lose all those valuable relationships and ways of working that have, we have seen during the pandemic? Um, so we felt it was important to understand, you know, what were the lessons learned from this experience, as well as um, what were the best optimal condition for involvement um, of community during events like a shock like this, um, but also that continuity going forward. So we've brought together a, a framework, which you can see it's organised across the um, phases of response during the pandemic. So preparedness on the early phases during and um, as we transition into recovery and beyond. Um, so really that highlights kind of lessons learned and um, perhaps an attempt to capture the best practice um, in terms of opportunities for actions that could be uh, considered or strengthened at these different phases. Uh, just to illustrate, for example, in the early preparedness book, came uh, forward quite strongly was actually having um, an appropriate, identifying appropriate organisations in the local area who could help uh, really harness, recruit, uh, manage the capacity and the surge of the volunteers that were coming forward, um, as well as support and make sure these are, you know, they're given in the right placement. And so there's that balance for demand and support as well. And another example might be uh, conducting these uh, mapping exercises, which uh, were uh, actually an ongoing exercise because the picture was changing so rapidly. So really understanding where does your vulnerable population live, where what's the geographical remit of the different groups that operate and do you have any gaps or, or for example, replication for services. Um, I, I think I don't have a lot of time to run through the framework, so I'll, I'll put a link to the report so you can read a little bit more um, about that. Um, but if you're interested, then I'll pass on back to um, Shahati for the closure. Wonderful. So um, just to, to briefly close, you know, as, as Lucia said, the, the links to the report are, are in there so you can read a lot more about it. There's a huge amount of information in it, but there's really three main main things um, in terms of sort of relevance in terms of this report to public health. And one is, um, as was mentioned earlier, it's about that concept of resilience and community resilience, particularly, and really building up that knowledge of how we can create an enabling environment for community led action that empowers our communities across Wales, increasing local volunteerism and social participation and understanding how communities um, and sectors can continue this successful partnership working that we saw during the pandemic in order to really build as resilient communities as we can. It's about understanding how communities can respond to future emergencies, not just pandemics, but things from climate change, from cost of living and all of these different adversities that communities face either individually or as a nation on their own. And how we can build more resilient and empowered communities that can respond and recover from these emergencies, which is really important for population health, both in Wales and internationally. And it's understanding how we might support the less resilient communities, the ones that are really more, more um, less able to withstand these shocks. Um, so through this improved understanding of community led action and how the, the, these valuable assets locally might be leveraged in response to events and the extent that these leveraging this community led action might contribute to health equity. It can help with policy decisions on how we might support the less resilient communities and help them prepare and whether that might be supporting um, investment into anchor institutions or providing empowerment structures within the local communities in order to make them more, more resilient and able to cope. So if we can just move on to the next slide. So um, this is our contact details um, and a copy of the, the um, a picture of the report. The link to the report is in the chat. And if you've got any questions, I think we're answering questions later. Here's our emails, but you can also ask us in the chat. And whilst the next speaker is talking, we can answer. So thank you very much. And we'll pass on to the next speaker, um, Fred Weston and Catherine Cribb. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name's uh, Fred and I'm the Community Support Network Lead for Monastery County Council. So um, I manage the uh, wellbeing team and a number of other kind of community um, ABCD based um, um, projects across Monmouthshire. Um, Kat, do you want to introduce yourself? You're on mute, Kat. Uh, 
I'm so sorry. OK, start again. I'm Catherine Cribb. I'm a qualified social worker in the wellbeing team, which is a subsection of the um, the community and uh, justice team in in uh, Monitor Council. Um, the social it's a social work role in a non statutory service, even though we are part of the local authority and it is pretty unique. Um, but uh, just briefly, with understanding of legislative duties around such areas as safeguarding the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, and many years of uh, managing complexity in my role as a social worker, I feel as if this is key to ensuring our team supports people's well-being and prevents them falling into crisis. Um, I'll hand you back to Fred. So uh, yeah, hopefully our, our presentation will give a, a bit of a, um, a practical demonstration of some of the stuff that uh, was talked about in the previous um, presentation. Um, so without further ado, I will share my screen and hopefully everything will work. And let's go. Whoops. Hi, welcome to this presentation on how Monmouthshire responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. This overview focuses on the partnership between Monmouthshire County Council and the community in supporting vulnerable people during lockdown and beyond. When lockdown was announced in March 2020, we knew that people would look to the council for help. We also knew that communities were strong and were already self-organised to support one another with shopping and prescriptions. We needed to work together with communities. Communities had the manpower, expert knowledge of people in place and were able to self-organise at a phenomenal rate. Monmouthshire has immense social capital and has one of the highest volunteering rates in Wales. Almost overnight, 80 self-organised community COVID-19 response groups were created by volunteers to deliver shopping to people who were shielding. This ranged from small village groups organised over WhatsApp to street monitors where each street had their own allocated shopper organised by a central volunteer, to groups organised by town and community councils. We needed to cut the red tape to allow this to happen, but also provide scaffolding so groups were robust and safe and knew where to come to if they needed help. We set up place-based teams across the five main towns of Monmouthshire, made up of officers with local knowledge. Their role was to map community activity, look for gaps, trends, and provide developmental support. They soon became the main liaison for groups, problem solving, and unlocking departments in the council. Basically, our mantra was, if you're doing something good in the community, then we want to support you. We've got your back. The wellbeing team was set up to work alongside the community, and the place-based team. Made up of two community link coordinators and a social worker, their role was to triage calls coming into the council and link a person up with community support. They would check if individuals are known to integrated services, housing or mental health teams. And we did this for a number of reasons. Sometimes people's support needs were above and beyond what could be supported by community volunteers. For example, people who presented challenging behaviour. Or some people already had regular services going in and it was more appropriate for those services provided the shopping and support. It soon became apparent that people needed or wanted a lot more support than what was being provided by community groups. Sometimes through a conversation with the social worker, the social worker would identify a potential social care need. So consent was sought then to refer that person to either occupational therapy, physiotherapy, sensory services, social services or housing. By the very nature of the people that we were supporting, people who didn't have people around them to do their their shopping or prescription uh, deliveries meant that a lot of those people were lonely and isolated and all of a sudden we were linking people into opportunities in their communities to do with loneliness and isolation and we were doing this in a significant proportion of cases. This was early intervention and prevention at its heart. With the influx of people wanting to be connected into their communities, there need to be opportunities to connect them to. But a lot of social opportunities had stopped during lockdown and there wasn't a lot to link people into other than telephone befriending and a few small uh, digital led social groups. So 
what we did have was lots of passionate and enthusiastic volunteers who wanted to make a difference in their community. We know that when we get people together, good things tend to happen. Community action networks were a way to bring local people, community groups and organisations together. These days they happen in spaces and places and hubs, but back in the pandemic, they happened over digital platforms like Teams and Zoom. A kind of event can range from the serious to the silly, campaigning to the caring, from the artistic to the athletic. The important thing is creating the opportunity for people to get together, because when they do, they collaborate, they exchange their acts of kindness, they share and they learn from one another. And these are the perfect foundations for building strong communities. And these are great foundations for building new social groups. Through the pandemic, community action networks allowed COVID-19 groups to learn from each other, share experiences and implement that learning so they could grow sustainably. A lot of the community fridges we see across Monmouthshire started off life in a community action network. And after the last lockdown, a plethora of community groups were started in community action networks. This opened up the world for the wellbeing team who could link into a whole range of new opportunities. But we didn't stop there. During the pandemic, we were also developing a old council building into a new community hub. TogetherWorks is our flagship community hub uh, that has been developed in partnership with Gabo. And the hub provides, in much the same way as a community action network does, a space where people can get together and collaborate and try new ideas and use the space for free to try those new ideas. They also receive development support from Gabo and some of the Monmouthshire County Council staff. In addition to the community activities that take place in the main space, we also have a range of different third sector organisations providing wellbeing opportunities So things like Women's Aid, our cells are there and people can access support to um, do volunteering in their community for Bridges Community Centre. The idea behind the place is that people will go in to access social groups, have fun, but also they'll have opportunity to access some of the, the wellbeing services as well without being stigmatised for going into the building with an obvious label of a community centre. Participatory budgeting is a more recent addition to how we create the additions, but essentially it's enabling communities to take control over how we spend money in the community. After all, they're the experts of their own situation. Uh, one example of how we've done this is through a funding program called You Decide. Um, community projects um, apply to the uh, to the program, and uh, the community uh, votes on the organisation or community projects which they um, think um, deserve uh, the money the most. And then the money was split up um, by proportion of the vote per area. Once our community groups are set up, we want to support them to be as resilient and sustainable as possible so that they can continue making Monmouthshire a thriving place to live for the long term and so that we can continue to link people into opportunities. Uh, the Communities and Social Justice team has uh, area needs which cover the five main towns and their surrounds of Monmouthshire providing bus spot support to community groups. The community is a training programme for community groups and volunteers. It has three main strands to it. So the first is uh, mentorship and um, mentorship involves linking a fledgling organisation with a been there, done it organisation so they can learn from their experience and expertise in a specific area. The second part is compliance and technical based training. And this is things like safeguarding, health and safety and food hygiene. And what it means is that we're able to support community groups so that they are compliant with legislation. And it also means as a wellbeing team that we can link them in knowing that that person is less likely to have a bad experience, for example, get ill with food poisoning. The last element of the programme is leadership training. And this is really um, developed because we are aware that a lot of our community leaders perhaps um, didn't have a background in leadership or they found themselves in leadership roles by accident, often volu volunteering to manage many, many other volunteers. And uh, we were also aware that the same volunteers are also linchpins of the organisation and they're at risk of stress, burnout and overwhelm. So we wanted to provide our community leaders with 
the same level of training that anybody in employment would expect to get around management. It's important to recognise the role of the social worker within the wellbeing team. The wellbeing team sits outside of health and social care services and for that reason it's quite unique that we've got a registered social worker in our team. Um, the social worker provides a number of roles, one of which is understanding the legislative framework and eligibility criteria um, to access informal services, which means that we're able to um, refer people up to services when we need to, but also keep them in the community um, for, for as long as possible. And that's only possible by providing bespoke support to community groups so that they feel well equipped to continue to support um, people in our communities. Part of this is um, building relationships and trust with our community groups. Um, sometimes um, social services don't always have the best reputation with community groups, but what CAT's been able to do is break down some of those pre-existing um, uh, barriers and really um, support groups to um, feel safe and comfortable in contacting CAT and using her as a bit of a sounding board. Um, you know, quite often people have niggling feelings regarding safeguarding, but don't feel confident enough to contact services to, to talk about it. And CAT's there specifically to do that with groups so that we're able to uh, make referrals at an early stage when we need to. We've gone over just a few things that we were able to do during the pandemic to create sustainable communities and connect people within those communities. Once the world opened up, we were able to do a lot more in terms of community development. And the Venn diagram on this slide illustrates how the different elements of what we do um, interact with one another. And the list on the right hand side illustrates just a few of the projects we do to create thriving and happy communities in Monmouthshire. Right, um, um, this is our team. Um, we, uh, you can see the individuals in the team there. They're, they're, I'm the social worker, that's me on the left. But I've been in post since uh, April 2020, right since the beginning of, the, of lockdown. Um, and uh, Paige and Becky were in the community north uh, focusing respectively on north and south monmouthshire more recently we've been joined by mandy and hannah who are, whose focus is to work with um, ukrainians and their hosts specifically um as they arrive in monmouthshire helping them uh, decide on next steps um can we have next slide slide please fred um so i know fred's covered a little bit about our remit in march 2020 uh, the, the well-being part of the the community and justice team was to support community groups and volunteers to help shielded members of our community to access food and medication that was it was so simple except it was very very intense um and more than two years later this has evolved into something very different although there is a consistent aim to address the impact of loneliness and isolation on the quality of people's lives. That runs through everything we do. And we were actually doing that at the beginning of the pandemic as well, because but my, for example, my husband was shielded, but um, we have a daughter who can do our shopping for her. We didn't ask, we didn't ring up the council and say, I need help with shopping. And what I think it did was, was put a spotlight on people who were socially isolated and had been long before the pandemic. Um, so what what we do is we we it's always done with consent initially for a friendly phone call simple as that so we would we will contact the person or visit them if they've got a hearing impairment for example and we have a we find out what they're interested in what they want what makes a difference that's as we've probably all heard of the what matters conversation so we link people up with things that are meaningful to them and they make a positive difference and uh, next slide please fred um, so who do we support? So the core of our work is really, you know, we, we get folk, phone calls from social services teams, the contact centre, mental health services, housing support. Um, the, the, it's quite a long list of people that's sort of every day 
bread and butter, if you like. Um, community centres and together works, they come at the end of the sentence, but they're not at the end of the focus of what we do, um, because we don't just communicate with local authorities or st statutory services. We, we try and place ourselves as much as we can in the community. Um, but also um, internally, the, the PPNs, which if people don't know, are sent by the police uh, ambulance or fire service to our safeguarding team when they've been to somebody's home and there's a concern um, and it's, it doesn't reach the threshold, of, uh, it doesn't meet the criteria for safeguarding, but there's still a concern, so it could be uh, domestic violence, there could be um, um, hoarding, it could be a certain level of apparent mental health problems. So, and any, anyway, we will screen for risk and relevance. Uh, so, sorry, the safeguarding team screen initially for risk and relevance, and then they send us over to us. Again, the police or whoever will have got that person's consent for us to phone them. Um, we're working trading standards at the moment. Enforcement, this is fascinating, I could talk about this for ages. Um, the the We've suckers just got a list. minute left, Catherine. Okay, well, scam victims, um, working with Ukrainian refugees and their hosts, which I've mentioned, um, employment and skills teams, and a new, a relatively new team in children's services, integrated families and children together. So we're working with them because the adults we work with, surprisingly or not, have children. Um, I th I think there's a little bit more in my minute. Could you do the next slide really quickly, Fred, please? Uh, and oh, that was it. I thought I missed something out. OK, yes, that's it. Um, I could have talked about, I could have expanded on any of those points. But thank you for listening, everyone. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I think we will we'll, we'll hand back. Thank you. Thank you, Fred and Catherine. And also to our other speakers, Nick, Charlotte and Lucia for your interesting uh, presentations today. Um, we've just got a few minutes left, so we'll try and squeeze in a few questions. Um, I think the first one is for you, Nick. Um, it's a question from Elizabeth. Do, do you think that austerity is causing the increase in demands? And if so, how are public bodies going to ensure that the move to enabling instead of providing is going to never make inequalities work? Uh, thanks for that. I would say that austerity is one of the contributing factors. Um, I think there are other things in play. I think expectations in terms of legislation is directing authorities to have to do very different things from their traditional ways of working. I think society as a whole is changing in terms of their expectations of public bodies as well. Um, austerity has clearly had an impact on the services, and I guess the risk of enabling um, people towards finding their own solutions could in the long run lead to um, an increase in more acute demand. Uh, and then this is partly, I guess, the principle that the social system and wellbeing has to be built on, that you try to keep people out of, of social care as long as possible by finding preventative community-based solutions wherever they're, they're available. Um, but I think you have to also balance this with the reality of where we are. Authorities do not have the funding to do everything they want to do. Um, we're in a very changed environment from austerity one. I think in the next few years, the, the budget settlement for Welsh Public Services is going to be extremely challenging. So I guess it's finding the best solutions that you can. So I don't think it's a, an either or situation. This is the reality of the world we now live in. So it's going to happen. You're not going to be able to do everything you're currently doing. So you've got to find the best fit for the services you do provide. And so that is going to be making some of these tough choices. OK, thank you. And uh, quickly then, just a question from Louisa. I wonder whether the speakers could comment on how to engage beyond the usual suspects within a community, as everyone's health would be benefited by being connected with their communities, but that often isn't the case. I'm happy to start with that one and then people can interfere because I just had a little think about that. And I think a lot of the work, one of the reasons that Lucy and I were particularly interested in this work is that we had this really unique context with the pandemic. It was a real, um, it was, it was, I mean, it was absolutely unique. And what we found was that individuals, they really, this pro-social motivation to supporting it their neighbours to supporting their communities is something that's quite unique to this sort of a emergency situation and it's really trying to understand how that that motivation can then be harnessed and tapped into and rebuilt almost um, within communities um, and there's also something about um, actually taking some of that that thinking in terms of building resilient communities and making sure that we reduce isolation, that people are more connected, that communities are helping themselves, that they're more empowered, that there's this bottom 
uh, up-driven approach, that real place-based approach, and making sure that actually all the structures they're put in place moving forwards from policies actually don't stop that happening, that they aren't creating barriers. So whether it is barriers to funding, whether it is removing and not putting funding into anchor institutions, and it's really thinking through actually how can you, you support the communities to be more resilient. There's also a lot with the sort, of, the sort of social prescribing movement and actually that thinking of health beyond just that medicalised model, but actually thinking about how the structures within sort of social prescribing and, and uh, can be put forward in order to try and link individuals with their communities and try and drive that behaviour, you know, whether it is not just through volunteering, but actually just going along to local groups, being part of your local community, being more resilient locally. And so that, that's my sort of warblings on but I don't I'm seeing a bit of nodding so I must be about on the right track <laughs> anyone else what, just want to comment quickly no okay um, for, for us in Monmouthshire um, there's been a lot around kind of trying to turn those um, people that are harder to reach into the usual suspects so how do we get those people into community spaces and places and then how do we go out to uh, go out to them where they are so we do a lot of engagement work in the streets uh, we're doing some participatory budgeting at the moment where we're working particularly with individual streets and asking people what do you want to do with a certain bit of money mm -hmm. and how would you like to spend it and all of a sudden we start to engage those people that we might not have ever reached before we work with our partners that are supporting um, um, people in our communities so that those partners are telling them about things that we're doing encourage them to come out and access some of our our provision so that um um, they they tend to those usual suspects there, you know, in places like um, Together Works and other hubs and community spaces. We do things like uh, leaflet drops. So if we are if we've got an event on, if we've got a community action network, for example, in a specific local area, we'll do a leaflet drop that day. We'll drop leaflets in and we'll leaflet everybody in that in that area. And actually, it's quite an old-fashioned way to do things, but it really does um, gain results. And people turn up people turn up that we've never ever met before, um, and that happens quite regularly. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Fred. Um, we're going to have to draw it to a close there as we've, we are, well, we've run out of time. Um, thank you. Thank you to all, your spe all the speakers um, for your excellent presentations today. Um, I'd be grateful if everyone could complete the short evaluation form. We've put a link in the chat for you to, um, for that, and we'll also be sending that out after the webinar as well. If you're not already a member, don't forget to join um, Public Health Network Cymru um, as a member and you'll get advance notice of all the events that we put on just just as the same as this one um and just lastly thank you everyone for attending apologies for the sound issues at the beginning some people had a few issues we're not sure what what caused those but hopefully you'll be able to catch up with the recording after the webinar um and just a final thanks to our speakers thank you all thank you everyone